Okay, good morning. I hope you've had a good weekend and um, you picked up the time to check the Excel spreadsheet again. I haven't checked since Thursday and you're gonna get another nagging email if you haven't. So please do go in and put your name into that spreadsheet or the company's name into the spreadsheet as soon as you can. I did also create that Google Shared spreadsheet about a week and a half ago. So if any of you have joined the class late, you might not see your name and there. just put your name at the bottom and add your company name. There's also one person, as far as I know, who's not in a group. So if any of you have groups of three or four would like another person in your group, let me know and I will put that person in touch with you. So any questions before we start? Okay, so we were in the middle of the CAPM, right? You remember where we were? We started with that first measure, the definition of risk as being variance. Variance of actual returns around an expected return. And remember the emphasis is on the future. It's never on the past. Who cares what's happened in the past? Second stop, and this is where we ended. We, talk, we talked about how not all risk is created equal. That some risk is specific to the company. Some is risk that affects most all companies. And the reason we drew that distinction is if you're an investor who has a diversified portfolio, the first type of risk goes away. I want to make sure everybody gets both the intuition and the statistics of why that happens, about why company, because it's, it's very counterintuitive, because when you think of an investment as a manager, you think about all risk. And what corporate finance is saying is not all of that risk will show up in your hurdle rate, because some or a big chunk of that risk will disappear in your portfolio. I want to make sure everybody's comfortable with that before we move on to the next step in the model. Are you comfortable with the notion of how? And we left the class with a question of, is the investor in your company thinking like a diversified investor? And I said, don't think about what you have in your portfolio. Think about the marginal investor. And remember the two things you need for a marginal investor, you need to own a lot of stock and trade that stock. Which leads you with this strange irony, if you're Larry Ellison and you've had 26% of Oracle, pretty much for most of the, the life of the company, to accomplish what you want, which is a higher stock price, you've got to keep the institutional investors in Oracle happy, not yourself happy. And that to me is one of the tests of whether you can go from being the founder and the CEO of a small company to the CEO of a large company is whether you can make that mindset transition where you can think about the company through the eyes of the marginal investors in the company. So the notion that diversification is good is age old. We've been, I mean, don't put all your eggs in one basket, preceded modern portfolio theory, right? I'm sure some farmer, you know, whose, uh, whose child was picking up eggs and they told, don't put all your eggs in one basket, but you might drop them and all the eggs will break. And that's been around centuries. So this is common sense, right? Spread your bets, diversify. But now let's ask a question. Why do we stop diversifying? And I'll make this personal. I have 50 plus stocks in my portfolio, but I have only 50 plus stocks. What do you mean only 50 plus? There are 45,500 publicly traded companies. I stopped at 50. Anton Schutz, can, let me ask you a question. Why did I stop at 52 or 53? You can give me the cruel answer. Why did I stop at 52? Uh, because the more you diversify, the closer you get to... Uh, oh, that's too sophisticated an answer. I just ran out of money. <laughs> you can say you're not worth billions. You have to stop, okay? But why does Fidelity Magellan, that has tens of billions of dollars, stop at 155 stocks? So this is kind of a generic question. Most people stop diversifying, but remember the marginal benefit of diversification gets smaller, but it doesn't drop below zero. It's, so you're right, the second stock creates more diversification benefits than the 22nd stock, which creates more than the 42nd, but even the 42,353rd stocks will create, but it's, going to, but it's still positive. So you kind of set up the answer, right? So there's got to be something on the other side now that we've got to bring in that stops us from continuing to keep adding portfolios. So Anton, I'm going to come back to you. What is that, 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 what am I weighing that benefit against? Uh, against the general market? Or the fact that there's a transactions cost, right? It's tiny now. 
I could trade on Robinhood and you're saying there's no cost. That's not true. There is no brokerage cost, but there's a bid ask spread. So there's a transactions cost and that transactions cost at some point exceeds the marginal benefit. And you say, you know what? I'm getting a benefit, but it's not big enough to cover them. And it's not just the transactions cost. It's a, now that you have it in your portfolio, you've got to keep your eye on it. So there's all this additional cost that come with it. And say, you know what? That cost is too much. I'm going to stop. So the first reason we stop is because of transactions cost. But if that were the only reason, we'd all be a lot more diversified than we are. Nate Smith, what's the second reason? Why does Fidelity Magellan stop with 155 stocks? Uh, what comes to mind is they just want to uh, match the market. They want to outperform the market. In fact, they collect fees from you by saying we can beat the market, right? So the second reason we stop is because we think, truly or not, that we can beat the market by picking the 155 best stocks. First reason is transactions cost. Second reason is we think we can pick stocks. You know what the CAPM is huge? No transactions cost. And what it euphemistically calls no private information. You know, what does that mean? You really don't know what stocks are cheaper expensive. Markets are so randomly distributed in terms of the mistakes, you can't pick good stocks from bad stocks. If I bring in those two assumptions into the process, no transactions cost, and you can't pick the right stocks, Nate, I'm gonna come back to you. When would I stop diversifying? Good question. You stop diversifying. Um, yeah, um, that's, I don't know. Would when never would stop, stop, right? I would keep adding and adding. When I would have 40 for every single traded stock in the world, every single traded asset. You're saying that is absurd, but it follows from those two assumptions, right? In fact, I will have every single traded asset in the market in my portfolio. What should I call that portfolio? Or oh, let's be creative and call it the market portfolio. And that's where every one of us will end up. We'll all hold, if we lived in the CAPM world, where there's no transactions costs and no private information, we'd all end up holding. Think of it as a gigantic index fund. It's not that unreal if you think about it. Vanguard is a total market index fund. Think of this as a gigantic index fund with every single traded asset in the world in the portfolio, and we all hold that portfolio. But here's a dilemma. I'm gonna pick three of you, William Clements, Dylan, and Andrew Taylor. You're going to be my, my guinea pigs here. Okay. William, let's assume you are a risk averse person. Don't, don't take it personally, I'm just giving you a characteristic you might not have. Let's say you're risk averse. Dylan is a little more risk loving and Andrew just loves taking risk. You live next to each other on the same street. You have roughly the same amount in your portfolio. What if I just said you all own the same index fund, right? You think, how do we differentiate the fact that some of us want to take more risk than others? You know how this is gonna play out? William, when I look at your portfolio, you're going to put your money in the same index fund, but you also decide how much cash to hold in your portfolio, right? What are you going to put in safe assets? And because you're risk averse, you know what you're going to do? You're going to put more money in that safe asset, risk-free asset. Think of it as a money market fund and less in the index fund. So let's say you put 50% in the index fund and 50% in this risk-free investment, a money market fund. Why? Because you're risk averse. I walk over to Dylan's house, I check his portfolio. He has the same index fund, the same 800 number he called as you did, but here's the difference. Because he wanted to take more risk, he's going to have all of his money in the index fund, maybe nothing in the money market fund because he feels pretty comfortable with the risk. And then I walk over to Andrew's house, he's run out of options, right? But if he wants to take even more risk than Dylan in this world, you know how we take that risk? he would actually borrow money and buy exactly the same index fund. You see what's happening in the CAPM world? We'll all hold the same index fund, this market portfolio. And what's going to be different across our holdings will be how much money we put in that fund and how much in the risk-free investment. In this world, none of us would buy a risky mutual fund. It doesn't make sense. You see why? Because you're giving up on diversification and getting nothing in return. Here we'll all be supremely diversified. And the only thing that's going to separate us is how much money we have 
in that index fund and how much in the risk was asset. We'd all hold those same two investments. We're almost there, if you can get that, because now we all hold the market portfolio. Now, if I come to you with an individual asset and say, tell me how risky this asset is. You know, I'm gonna measure the risk. I'm gonna measure the risk in that asset by how much risk it adds to what I already own. Remember, we all own the market portfolio. The risk of an asset then becomes the risk that it adds to the market portfolio. You've just won the Nobel Prize. You've derived the CAPM. That was exactly what Bill Sharp derived in 1964 to win the Nobel Prize. He said, the risk has to be the risk added to the market portfolio. And if we can measure that risk, we're home free. And you know how we're gonna measure the risk? We're gonna measure the risk by how this particular stock or investment you're looking at moves with your market portfolio. Let me give you three scenarios. Let's assume you have an investment which moves a lot, but doesn't move at all with the market portfolio. That investment in the CAPM world will add no risk to your portfolio because adding it on will not affect your risk because it's uncorrelated with the market. Conversely, if you have an investment that moves up and down with the market, it's more risky because adding it on will add to the overall risk. And if you add an investment that actually moves in the opposite direction as the rest of the market, adding that to your portfolio could actually reduce the risk of your portfolio. We've already opened the door to the possibility that an investment could actually be a risk reducing investment from the cap and perspective. Not that it's not volatile, but it, so it's how an investment moves with the market that we look at when we think about the risk of an investment. Statistically, we capture that co-movement with what's called a covariance. Covariance is like a correlation dressed up. It basically looks at how much your stock or investment moves with the market portfolio. And the bigger the covariance, the riskier an investment. In the original version of the cap app, if you stop there, Michael, pressure, if I told you the covariance of Disney with the market portfolio is 35%, which is roughly what it is, What's the, biggest, big, what's the biggest challenge you face? You look at the 35% and ask you, is that high? Is that low? Is that typical? I guess you would have to know what the, the typical percentage of the market was. You'd have to know what the variance. So in a sense, none of us does, right? You'd have to be a very strange person to walk around saying, I know what the, the overall COVID. So if I can somehow standardize that number, It'll be more usable, right? So here's what I do. I take the covariance of Disney with the market. I divide it by the overall variance of the market. You know what that gives me? That gives me a beta. Beta is just a standardized version of covariance and covariance measures risk because we assume that everybody holds a market portfolio and everybody holds a market portfolio because there are no transactions costs and no private information. And all of this is premised on the assumption that variance measures risk. Do you see how the assumptions stack up on top of each other? So when I say the beta of a stock is 1.2 and you pull it off Bloomberg or wherever, and you plug it into an equation and you come up with an expected return, remember the baggage you're bringing to the process because any one link in that story breaks down. Beta might not be a measure of risk. But if you hang in there and you accept all of the assumptions, beta becomes your measure of risk. It's standardized around one. So when I take Disney's beta and it says 1.2, I'm saying it's 1.2 times more risky. And it gives you an opening to come up with an expected return because the expected return in Disney will then be the risk-free rate. That's the starting point. Plus the beta for Disney, which measures relative risk. And then the premium you demand for an average risk investment, an investment with a beta of one. So as an example, if I'm demanding 5% as my premium for investing in an average beta stock, a beta one, and Disney has a beta 1.2, I'm gonna demand 1.2 times 5%, which is 6% as the additional risk premium for Disney. That's it. That is the cap. Came out in 1964. 
it was the first explicit model for risk and return in, in finance. And people started using it. Unlike most economic models that die in textbooks, the CAPM found its way into practice, people started using it. And then, in fact, much of the pushback against betas came from within the people who actually developed betas. The same researchers who came up with betas said, what can go wrong? And let's list out the things that the CAPM, that can go wrong in the CAPM. The first is, does the model make unrealistic assumptions? I mean, remember the test we actually ran, right? Skewness, where I told you, would you pick a stock with that 400% payoff versus 50? And most of us said, yes, we like big payoffs. We want to avoid big losses. The CAPM ignores it, so clearly that's unrealistic. It ignores transactions costs, that's unrealistic. It assumes that none of us has access to private information, information that none, the market doesn't have. That's unrealistic. So one of the pushbacks you get in the CAPM is it makes unrealistic assumptions. And to which my response is, so what? I started my student life as an economist and I very quickly gave up on it because I remember those econ classes and models where you made realistic assumptions and you ended up with models that nobody can use. I still remember the econ class where my econ professor said, if you know the second derivative of the utility to wealth function, you can come up, you can price pretty much everything. And I said, that's neat. How would I observe my utility function? And he said, nobody's ever done it yet, but once you do it, it's all going to be clear. Remember the U double prime W in econ class? I said, what the heck is that? If you can see that, then everything's going to be clear. Given a choice between a model that makes realistic assumptions and ends up with conclusions that nobody can use and a model that makes unrealistic assumptions and ends up with a model that you can use, I'll take the latter over the former every single time. So in classic economists attack finance for being too pragmatic and making these assumptions that are not realistic, I say, I'm glad. At least we have a model you can use. The second critique you will hear, and this will be from the coward in the back row because I've had this happen. I go, you know, I go in and I present a valuation or a corporate finance built on betas. Some guy in the last row put up his hand and he said, how can you use this model? You could be wrong. I said, but what? Your beta could be wrong. Your equity risk premium could be wrong. To which my response is, you think that's all I got wrong? You should see my earnings, my cash flows, my growth rates, they're all wrong. You know why they're wrong? Because I'm trying to estimate the future. If your test for a model is I will not use it unless it's right, you might as well give up right now. Makes unrealistic assumptions, not a big deal. The parameters could be wrong, I can live with that. Every model is gonna have wrong parameters. The third critique though cuts to the bone. Remember I said one of the tests of a good model is whether it actually works. So if the CAPM works, what is it saying? The only measure of risk that should matter over very long periods is your beta. So if I gave you the beta for every stock over the last 50 years, and I gave you returns on every stock over the last 50 years, 50 years is a long period, right? What percentage of the differences in returns across stocks should be explained by betas? Dwanish? If the CAPM is in fact the right model, and I take a 50 year period, I give you the betas for every stock, the returns in every stock, the actual returns. What percentage of the difference in return should actually be, it should be explained by betas? All of it. All of it. If it's a perfect model. Now that might be asking for too much, 100% R squared. But 70% would be nice, right? 65%. In 1992, Gene Farmer and Ken French, two professors at the University of Chicago. And Gene Farmer was at Chicago when the CAPM was developed. So he was one of the people who founded finance as a discipline. Asked a very simple question. What percentage of the actual difference in returns across stocks is explained by betas? In other words, is it 100%? It's not 50%, it's not 40%, it's not 30%, it's 7%. Think about it. The CAPM explains 7% of the differences in returns across stocks, betas, laundry. 
which is a nice way of saying we're using a model that doesn't explain 93% of the variation returns. Now we're in deep trouble, right? Now, I think they overstated their case. I don't think it's as low as 7%, but the reality is the kappa, even if you fixed every single parameter, is a model that doesn't really seem to fully explain returns or even partially explain returns. And we came to this realization in finance by the mid seventies. So people started to look, looking for alternatives. So I'm gonna, rather than spend days on this and people spend an entire lifetime on this, I'm gonna spend 10 minutes giving you alternatives to the CAPAM and why none of them has acquired roots in actual practice. What I mean by that, you go to Bloomberg, what's the measure of risk they report? Beta. You're saying that's 50, you know, 60 years later, you don't have a better model. Let's talk about the alternative to CAPM. Now we saw what the CAPM did, right? It assumed no transactions cost, no private information. We all ended up with one portfolio, the market portfolio, and we measured the risk of every stock with a single beta. But the premise here is the risk you're measuring is risk you cannot diversify away, market risk, macroeconomic risk. So 1978, a professor at Yale, Steve Ross said, hey, you know what? We know that market risk is the only risk that matters, but why are we trying to capture all of that with one beta? Why don't we allow for multiple sources of market risk or macroeconomic risk, things like inflation, interest rates, there are lots of different macroeconomic factors. Why don't we allow for multiple source of market risk and have betas against each one? Sounds reasonable, right? Rather than try to capture it all with one beta, why don't we allow for five market risk factors and five betas, or three market risk factors and three betas? People said that sounds nice, but how will we know how many sources of market risk there are and what the betas are? He said, that's easy. Give me 50 years of daily stock return data and I can tell you. So how is historical data and individual stock. What's the definition of market risk? It affects most companies at the same time, right? So here's what he did. He took 50 years of returns on stocks. He fed it into a really powerful computer. In those days, he had to use a mainframe computer. And he ran what's called a factor analysis. A factor analysis is a statistical approach where the data is looked at and what the computer looks for are common patterns. That's what a factor is. So basically it's going through 50 years saying, hey, these 600 companies seem to move together a lot of the time. And each time it finds a pattern, it calls it a factor. And the output from a factor analysis is twofold. It comes back and says, I found five factors in your 50 years of data, five things that seem to move stocks together. And here are the betas for each stock against each of the five factors. This is almost magical. The computer tells you how many factors there are, it tells you what the betas are. And when this model came out, it was called the arbitrage pricing model. And people thought that this was the answer to all of our problems, but it never caught on. And to see why it never caught on, let's play the role of somebody using this model. Let's suppose you're a banker at Solomon Brothers in 1979. The model has just come out. You're very excited, this looks great. You can replace that old beta and the cap M. You want to show your clients how sophisticated you are. I'm gonna play the role of your client, I'm Pepsi. You're my banker, you come in. And remember, I need this model to come up with the cost of equity, a hurdle rate. And you tell me, look, we have this great new model. It's called the arbitrage pricing model. And using that model, your cost of equity, your hurdle rate is 22%. I'm shocked and said, we've always used like 18%. Why is it so high? And you tell me, you tell me it's because I'm very sensitive to the second factor. I have a high beta against the second factor. What's the answer, question you're gonna get from me? Mallory, if, I told, if you told me my, co my cost of equity is high because I'm very sensitive to the second factor, what's the question you're gonna ask me? Um, I'm not sure. I was actually just looking up. Does APM stand for arbitrage pricing model? It's called the arbitrage pricing model. We'll talk about why. But if I, if you told me that my cost of equity is high because I'm very sensitive to the second factor, 
what's the logical question you're going to get from me as a client? I don't know anything about these models. You told me my hurdle rate is going to be much higher because I'm very sensitive to the second factor. You're probably going Maybe to ask Maybe like, me what, what, what can you do about that? Oh, what okay. is the second factor, right? And I'm going yeah. to tell you, I don't know what it is, but be very careful when it's around. You're going to throw me out there. I mean, who is going to adopt a model where I can't tell you what this? But you see what happened, right? What did this? When I ran a factor analysis and it told me there were five factors, you know what it called them? Factor one, factor two, factor three, factor four. It's not an economic model. It's a statistical model. And the reason it's called the arbitrage pricing model is because if things are priced right, you cannot make a riskless profit because everything is already built in. But because I couldn't name the factors, or you couldn't name the factors, I threw you out. So for lawn, you walk back to your office. It's 60 miles away, but what else do you have to do? And as you walk back, you think about why your pitch failed. It's because when I asked you what the second factor was, you wouldn't have an answer, right? Therein lies a solution. If you could somehow put names on each of the five factors, you know what the names have to be, right? It, they'd have to be macroeconomics. Factor one is inflation. Factor two is interest rates. Factor three is the term structure. Then you'd be more be believable, right? You can arbitrarily name the factors. So for the next few years, here's what both academics and practitioners did. They tried to find names for the factors by looking at the past. And they say, you know what? Factor one looks a lot like interest rates are moving. So think of it as superimposing two graphs on each other and saying, hey, factor one's graph looks a lot like interest rates. Let's call it interest rates. And after many millions of dollars and thousands of pages of research, they actually attach names to each of the five factors. When you attach macroeconomic names to those unnamed factors, you've gone from the arbitrage pricing model to what's generically called a multi-factor model fancy name, but it's basically the arbitrage pricing model with names attached to it. This is good, right? We're almost there. So let's play the role of Solomon Banker. 80, 1984, you show up at my offices again. I don't even remember you because I threw you out so quickly the last time around. He said, you know what? We have a new model. We call it the MFM. This is something you learn in almost every discipline. We create acronyms along the way because it gives this illusion of we've created this mystical thing. You're not allowed in this society if you don't know what the acronym stands for. It's a multi-factor model. And then I tell you, based on the factors in this model, your hurdle rate is 20%. It's still a little high. You ask me, why is it so high? You tell me it's because you're really sensitive to the second factor. But this time you're ready for my question. In fact, if I don't ask the question, you'll ask it yourself, which is, what the heck is the second factor? And you tell me it's oil prices. And I said, what? We don't use any oil at Pepsi. It might taste like we do. What's oil prices got to do with us? Do you see what happened? When people put names to the factors, they looked at past data. And I'm all of you are too young to remember it, but the 1970s was a decade when oil prices drove a lot of what happened in markets. It was a big factor driving stock prices. So when they were fitting factors, they said, you know what, oil prices fits, let's put that in. The only problem is by the time you got to 1984, oil prices were back down to $30 a barrel and nobody cared about oil anymore. Do you see the problem with multi-factor models? Is I can fit great factors going backwards. Maybe COVID will be a factor right now. But our job is to forecast the future. These factors no longer work going forward. So multi-factor models, People kept trying, they came up with different factors. And after a while, people threw up their hands and said, this isn't helping me. It's not helping me come up with, come up with the hurdle rate. Right? So let's say we, we, we start with a cap M, we tried the arbitrage pricing model, nobody wanted because the factors were unnamed. We tried the multi-factor model. We named the factors, but they kept changing. So we get to the 1992 paper. That same paper where Farmer and French asked the question, how much debate is explained? They asked a different question. They said, why are we even trying to build a risk and return model? Why don't we let the market tell us what's risky and what's safe? You're saying, how will the market tell you? If you take 50 years of data, some companies made higher returns than other companies, right? 
if you can somehow find common characteristics in those companies, say so these types of companies made higher returns, then you'd have a proxy for risk. It's a proxy because it's a standard. I'm not gonna be mysterious. The 1992 paper is now famous in finance because they found two factors. One was your market capitalization as a company. They found that small companies in terms of market cap earn much higher returns than large companies. And then they made a leap of faith. They said, if small companies on higher returns, they must be riskier. Do you see the danger here? You're trusting markets to be right in the long term. And they say, you know what? If small companies on higher returns, they must be riskier. Market cap became a proxy for risk. They found that companies that traded low price to book ratios, market value was much lower than book value, earned higher returns than companies with high price to book ratios. They said, that must mean that low price to book companies are riskier than high price to book companies. In fact, as the final piece of their research, they actually ran a regression of returns on, on a company against market cap and price to book. And they were able to explain like 45% of the variation in stocks. And that equation could now become your way of coming up with a hurdle rate, right? So if you're a company say, what's my hurdle rate? I'm gonna ask you two questions. What's your market cap? What's your price to book ratio? I'm gonna plug into the regression. We say, you know what? Your hurdle rate is 7%, 11%, 15%. And you're gonna complain like crazy if you're a small company with a low price to book ratio because I'm gonna give you a high hurdle rate. You say, look, but I'm a small company with predictable earnings. I'm gonna say, I don't care, you're a small company. Proxy models, basically you're letting the proxy stand in for risk. And in portfolio management, this has replaced the cap in how mutual fund managers get measured. So if you're a manager who invests primarily in small cap stocks, rather than measuring you against the cap I'm measuring against the proxy models, but in corporate finance, it doesn't help very much to put a proxy model because it gives you almost no degrees of freedom, right? Nothing you do as a company can then alter your cost of equity. You can go to a safer business model, even a perfectly guaranteed revenue stream, and I'm still giving you a high cost of equity. What I'm trying to explain is why the cap M persists. Why when you go into Bloomberg, you still see beta as your primary measure of risk. It's not because academics believe that beta is a perfect model. It's not even close. But I'm reminded of what Winston Churchill once said about democracy. He said, it's a terrible model until you compare it to the alternatives. You know why the cap persists? It persists because its alternatives are either so complex that, they don't, or that they're not worth it, but ultimately the alternatives don't deliver a better measure of expected return. So you hear people say the beta doesn't work, right? I've read about that, beta is terrible. And so you're right, beta is terrible, but give me an alternative. If you don't want to use betas, what do you want to use instead? I'll give you my suggestions on alternatives, but I'm laying the foundations for something you're going to hear, cap M, betas, because the economist has buried betas like seven times in the last 50 years. Beta's dead, beta's dead, beta's dead. But like Freddy Krueger, beta keeps coming back. It comes back because the alternatives are just so incredibly bad as well. In fact, um, if, you know, when I do evaluation and somebody says, oh, how come you're using betas? And the less they know, the more dangerous they become on this. How come you're using betas? I always respond with an anecdote. You're welcome to borrow this anecdote because if you're in finance, you will get asked this question. How come you're using betas? I tell them about these two campers who are stuck up in the mountains. It's late at night. You know, getting, they're getting ready to go to bed when they hear the sound of a crazed grizzly coming at them through the forest. So one of the campers zips up in a sleeping bag, gets ready to die. I don't know what form that takes, but you know, the, the, the process of getting ready to die. The other guy starts running in place, warming up. And the guy in the sleeping bag says, what are you doing? You can't outrun a grizzly. They run 50, 60 miles an hour and they're crazed. And the guy's warming up says, look, I don't have to outrun the grizzly. All I have to do is outrun you. Think about that for a moment, because it's so easy to take a model and find what's wrong with it. The cap has lots of things wrong with it. I use the cap with completely open eyes. I do think we can improve on that 7% with better ways of estimating betas. And I'm going to take you through the process. 
But you know what? Even if I did everything right, I don't think I'll have a model that explains more than 25 or 30% of what's going on. Can you ask me why? There are 65 million people walking around thinking Elvis is still alive. There are millions of Redditors buying stock because somebody who calls himself the Roaring Kitty has told them, told them GameStop will keep going up. Of course you're gonna have a lot of stuff you can't explain. How the heck are you gonna build a model with 100% R squared in the world where people make strange decisions? I'm a realist on this. I will use the cap until I find something better. And right now, it's still the best game in town. And I'm gonna leave it with that very tepid defense. It's not a defense of the cap as a great model. It works amazingly well. It's, it works at least as well as the next best, best alternatives. And it gives you a lot more control over the process. It's a lot simpler. Why would I estimate five betas and screw up when I can do it with one beta? Why go to all that additional trouble until you get, unless you're getting a lot of room for the money and you're not right now? So any questions about the, about the CAPM? Now I'll have to tell you all of these alternative models, CAPM, arbitrage pricing model, multi-factor model, they're all built on the premise that your marginal investor is diversified. So that's why I made such a big deal about checking that out because, and I want you to look at your company. This is not generic because this is about your company and look at the percentage stock held by individuals, insiders, institutions, and pass the judgment. It's not going to be perfect, but based on what you see in your company, is the marginal investor a diversified investor? Because the answer is yes your life just got a lot simpler. Any of these models can be carried through. If your answer is no, your life became a lot more difficult, not impossible. We'll come back and talk about how to estimate the cost of equity for a private business with undiversified investors. But that's your first stop in this project is once you got the corporate governance section, nailing down who the marginal investor is. Any questions before we continue? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm curious. I'm not sure how we get the, the market risk premium number. We're, we're going to talk about that. In fact, we haven't talked about any specifics. I haven't told you how to get the risk free rate. Forget so, about the market premium. So I'm going to start with the risk free rate. We're going to move to the, the equity risk premium. And then we're going to talk about betas in that sequence. Okay, so let, uh, let's hold off on that. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just curious why we're assuming that the, the issue with the cap M and all these alternative models is the measure of risk, uh, you know, the beta and not how we're pricing that risk through that risk premium. Well, because when you're looking at the past, the risk premium is known. It's an actual risk premium. So that's not estimated, right? So if the cap M is right, no matter what the market return is, the differences across companies should be explained by betas. So that's the advantage of looking backwards is the risk premium is known, the risk free rate is known, the only number you don't, you, you, that, that varies across companies is the beta and it doesn't seem to do very well. Any other questions? What happens if your company doesn't have a marginal investor and you look up and there's just Black Rocks and State Street? Somebody's and setting the price. It does, it, remember the marginal investor is not an individual, it's not a named entity. I'm not going to say a marginal investor is Black Rock. Yeah. Or state street. I'm going to say it's an institutional investor. The name can shift around, right? I mean, you really don't care that in BlackRock one month and it's Vanguard the next and state street because they all are diversified. That's why when you do the marginal investor, rather than name the marginal investor, think about the type of investor who's the marginal investor. So now let's talk about what Michael raised as an estimation issue. Let's say you do buy into the cap M. To use the cap M, you need three numbers. You need a risk free rate. You need a risk premium, a risk premium. And now it's more difficult because unlike the past, the future is saying, how do I know what I learn on stock? And you need a beta. I think people do a terrible job on all three in practice. And I might break a few idols as I go along and how you were taught to do it at work, but I really don't care how you were taught to do it at work because people mangle these models in practice. Of those three numbers, the number that should be simplest to estimate should be the risk free rate, right? So let me give you what I would look for for something to be risk free and then let's go on a journey to find it. For something to be risk-free, you need to know exactly what you will make with certainty. 
Remember the example I gave you of, uh, you know, of what the actual returns are relative. You need to know exactly what you will make, which means there are two conditions you need to meet for something to be risk-free. The first is the entity issuing the security that you just bought or the, gave you the promise that you're holding on to can have no default risk, not zero. Already I put a condition that's going to be pretty tough to meet, right? And second, if you're looking at multiple periods, if you're getting cash flows in the middle, you can't be uncertain about what you can reinvest the money at because if you get cash flows in your one and two and three and you don't know what the rates will be that create. So there can be no default risk and no reinvestment risk. So let's be purists. If I wanted a one year risk free rate then in US dollars and you assume the US treasury was default free, you would use a one year table rate. Right? Because in a one-year table, you get, if I gave you a two-year time period, so what's the risk-free rate? You would use a two-year table, but there's one small complication, which is on a two-year table, you get a coupon at the end of the first year, which you now have to reinvest at some rate you don't know. Is there a way I can take that coupon out? Because if I took that coupon out and I had just a cash flow at the end of year two, then it would be more closer to risk-free. Can I take a coupon out of a coupon bond? Yes, you can do it. So in fact, think of the coupon. You know how you get coupons from grocery stores? Think of a 10-year coupon bond. You get 10 annual coupons if it's an annual coupon, and then you get the face value. And in a regular coupon, you can strip the coupons, right? If I take the coupons out of a coupon bond, it becomes what's called a zero coupon bond. In a zero coupon bond, you get no coupons, but you get the face value at the end. In a world of purists, that's what you would need as a risk free rate. The one year zero coupon is your one year rate. The two year zero coupon is the two year rate. The three year zero, you're saying, what a pain in the neck. I completely agree. That's why I'm not a purist. A purist, your risk free rate will actually be different for each time period because you have to find a one year. It's not difficult to find. You go to Bloomberg, you can actually pull up zero coupon yield curves. It's just your Excel spreadsheet now become a bit of a nightmare because you can't use the present value function anymore. You have to do each year separately. So I'm going to cheat. And here's how I'm going to cheat. You know, the old days, banks used to be managed with what's called duration matching. In a perfectly hedged bank, here's what you should do. If you have a two-year asset, you should have a two-year loan to match it, a five-year asset with a five-year loan. So the perfect bank, you'd match each asset with a, with, with a liability of equivalent duration, of an equivalent life. But in a regular bank where you make hundreds of loans, thousands of loans, matching each loan up is going to be too much of a pain. So here's what you were taught to do. You were, you were taught to take the average duration of your loans. So some of your loans are 30, some are 20, some are 15, some are 10. You take the average, a weighted average duration, reflecting on and then try to have assets with roughly the same weighted average duration. It's not perfectly matched, but you've substantially reduced interest rate risk. I'm going to borrow that concept. Let's say you sit down to do a project analysis. It's a 10 year project. You have cash flows in year one, cash flows in year two, cash flows in year three, all the way through cash flows in year 10. You could compute a weighted average of when your cash flows come in, right? It's going to be less than 10 because you have cash flows coming in each year. Let's say the weighted average duration of your cash flows is seven and a half years. If you use a risk-free rate with roughly the same duration. A 10-year bond, for instance, because you get coupons every year, has a duration of roughly seven and a half years. You match closely enough that you can now use that as your risk-free rate forever. It's cheating, but I'm going to take it. I'm going to save you, in fact, a whole lot of trouble because in corporate finance, almost everything we do is long-term. And because everything we do is long-term, I don't care what the three-month table rate is. Who really cares? I'm going to go with a long-term default-free rate as my risk-free rate, if I can find that. Now, I haven't defined what long-term is. Is it 10 years? Is it 30 years? We'll come back and talk about that. But if I can find a long-term default-free rate, I've essentially got a risk-free rate. That's going to be my mission. You give me a currency, my job is to find a long-term default-free rate. It doesn't even have to be a zero coupon, some long-term bond in that currency. 
Does everybody buy into what I'm trying to do now? Because I'm going to start easy currencies and then we're going to step up the ladder and make the currencies more difficult. Most of you are doing companies where your currency of choice is the US dollar. And I'm going to tell you up front that just because a company is located in a country doesn't mean you're locked into that country's currency. We'll talk about how you could, I mean, with the US, obviously you're gonna pick the US dollar, but if you're doing a Russian company, you might not want to deal with Russian rubles. We'll talk about why, but you can make a currency separation, but most of you are doing, working with the US dollar. So let's start with the US dollar. If I wanted a risk-free rate in US dollars, using my definition of it being a long-term default free rate. Olga? You're, you're on the spot, so tell me, if I want a risk-free rate in US dollars, I want a long-term default free rate, what would I use as my risk-free rate? I prefer to use treasury bonds. Okay, and as implicitly, what are you assuming about default risk in the US treasury when you do that? Let's make it explicit. I assume, want very, I assume very low default rate. This isn't, I mean, this is zero one. So basically we're assuming no default yeah. risk. I, I, assume, assume, I, assume, I assume this is zero actually. Okay. So you'd use, and basically using the 10 year, uh, or the, so we'll talk about 10 or 30 year, because at least in the US with bonds, you've got 10 year bonds, you've got 30 year bonds. Mm -hmm. But the risk-free rate in US dollars, we use the T bond rate, then we get down on our knees and say, please God, let there be no default risk in the US treasury because we're treating it as default free. I'm gonna give away the game. Whenever you see me compute a risk-free rate in US dollars for the rest of this class, I'm gonna use the 10 year T bond rate as my risk-free rate. And I'll tell you why I picked the 10 year over the 30 year. 30 years is longer. I mean, obviously if I'm doing a valuation, I might want even longer, but I'm gonna go with the 10 year rate because the 10 year rate has the longest continuous history of any T bond. 30 year bonds come and go. There have been periods where it hasn't been issued. It also is always the freshest rate, the most heavily traded of all of the T bonds. So it's liquid, the rate, the 30 year bond has some quirky components to it. So I'm gonna use the 10 year bond rate. So for the US dollar, my risk-free rate is the 10-year T-bond rate. And right now, does anybody know what that number looks like? Jeremy Zita, do you know what the 10-year T-bond rate looks like right now? You can pass if you. Anybody have a sense of where it is right now? Come on. You haven't even been looking at the Wall Street 135. Journey? 135. And you know where it started the year? It's, I don't think it's as high as 135, but it's risen up. It's like 125 maybe. It started the year at, or maybe it's 135 because it went up at the end, but it started the year at 0.93%. In the, even in the seven weeks we've been, from the start of the year, you can see how rates have moved. We'll talk about why they might've moved, but the risk rate in US dollars is 130, 135%. 1.35%. Is anybody doing your analysis in euros? Anybody want to be my, any, anybody doing a European company in euros? Nobody? I believe I am. Okay, so who are you doing? Give me the name of what country is your company in? Uh, it's in Italy, I'm doing Juventus. Okay. So it's an Italian company, perfect. So you want a risk-free rate in euros. I'm gonna help you out here. This is November of 2013, but you face the same challenge today. In November of 2013, I was looking for a risk-free rate in euros, and I went looking for a 10-year government bond in euros, and I ran into a bit of a problem. I found about a dozen European governments with 10-year euro bonds, and the rates were all different. And you're going to find the same scenario today. If you're trying to get a risk-free rate in euros, and you look up a 10-year euro bond, you're going to get the German government, the European, the Italian government, the Spanish government, the Portuguese, the French, the, the Dutch. So let me ask you a question. If I'm doing a risk-free rate in euros in November of 2013, which of these bond rates would I use as my risk-free rate? And if you're in my valuation class, no fair answering because you've seen the answer already. Which of these rates is your risk-free rate if you're doing things in euros? Mekla? Would it be the lowest? Would it be Germany's? It is, and tell me why. That it would be the lowest, so tell me intuitively why you would pick the lowest. I'm not entirely sure, but I'm gonna guess, do you wanna go with a lower number to be on the safe side? No, that's the wrong answer, because then you go with the Swiss franc rate, which is even lower, right? It's not that you're trying to be conservative, but because these are all Euro bonds, the only reason for differences across these bonds is not currency. They're in the same currency. It's because 
people see more risk in Greece and Italy and Spain than they do in Germany, right? And the essence of risk-free is there can be no default risk. In fact, even with the German euro bond, people will push back and say, even the German government has some default risk because the problem with having a currency that you no longer control is you can't print currency. That's what usually gives you this. I mean, the US treasury is not the best run institution in the world. The reason there's no default risk is they can print money. So the people actually argue the ECB, the European Central Bank rate, which is very close to German Euro bond rate is the risk-free rate. But we're picking the lowest because we want something risk-free. Now, part of you says, but it's an Italian company. I want to punish it. I'll give you plenty of chances to punish your company for being Italian or Greek or Portuguese, but don't do it in the risk-free rate. In euros, your risk-free rate will be the German Euro bond rate no matter where you are in Europe, Spanish company, Italian company, Portuguese company, or German company, we're gonna use the German Euro bond rate. Everybody comfortable with that? So we've gone US dollar, and we, even with, with the Euro, we had an advantage. There was at least one government which was viewed as default free, the German government issuing bonds. You're saying, why am I not using the Swiss franc rate? It's a different currency. I can't compare across currencies. So in November of 2013, for those currencies where I was able to get a default free entity, the Canadian government, the Australian government, the Swiss government, at that time, the UK government, I just took the government bond rate as my risk rate. The UK is no longer triple A, so we can't do that anymore. But in 2000, November of 2013, these were the risk free rates in different currencies where there was a default free entity. Notice the rates are different. I'm gonna come back and focus on those differences in a couple of minutes, but these are the risk-free rates in different currencies. And these are easy currencies because I could find a country, at least one country, which was AAA rated issuing bonds in that currency. Any questions up till now? Because now we're going to get into some messy territory where the government, where, the, where there are currencies, but there's no default free entity issuing bonds in that currency. But is everybody comfortable so far? You said the U.S. could print money, but can't Zimbabwe print money too? I don't think that's true. The, other, the, the and the question is why doesn't why does any? In fact, Dan's raising a very interesting question. Why would any government ever default in its local currency? How would the Indian government default in rupees? And I've heard that pushback, which is, why don't you just use the government bond rate if it's in the local currency? What's the big deal? You can never default. The problem is an empirical problem. Half of all sovereign defaults in the last 50 years have been local currency defaults. Governments that could have printed currency chose to default. But let's deal with it. Why do governments default if they can print more currency? Inflation. Uh, inflation. Okay, help me out. Who said that? I'm sorry, I couldn't see you flashed on and off. Sam, was, was it you? Oh, yeah. Said? Go ahead. Uh, Raymond, yeah. Raymond here. Go ahead. Yeah, so, so when you said inflation, what are you talking about? Money, they, they, will do, uh, they have inflation, and I think yeah. it will be harder for them to, you know, to recover the economy. Okay. So you have a choice, right, as a government. You're in a crunch. You don't have the money to pay debt. You can print more money and pay off the debt, in which case you debase your currency, or you can default. And the government has to decide. You're between a rock and a hard place. You're saying, which is worse? And Latin America, which is, if you think about it, everything we know about sovereign default, Latin America teaches us because it's almost like this lab experiment of sovereign default after sovereign default has started lots of lessons. I went to Brazil for the first time in 1997. That was five years after they had hyperinflation. Brazil in the early 90s at 5,000%. This is not just inflation, it's just your currency has become worthless. When I went in 1997, the entire country was obsessed with inflation. I would do a valuation session for two days and every question was about inflation. And it showed up in other ways as well. Brazilian analysts did none of their analysis in REIs, everything was done in US dollars. Brazilian companies, when they issued bonds, would not issue them in reais, they issued them in dollars because nobody would buy a long-term rei denominated bond. The Brazilian government did not issue long-term bonds in reais because nobody wanted to buy. People had lost faith in the currency. It took Brazil 
almost 15 years after that hyperinflation before the Brazilian government could issue bonds in Rias. That's what debasement does. In contrast, think of Argentina in any just world. Nobody should ever lend to Argentina ever again, right? What has this country shown you? Every five years, they've shown you they can default. And it's almost like we have this amnesia. I remember I was in 2016, I was invited to come to Argentina and talk about valuation because it was a second coming of Argentina. They said, Argentina is back, investors are back. We're never going to default again. And there are thousands of you know, portfolio managers who gathered together celebrating the next coming of Argentina. You know what that taught us? That you can come back from default a lot more quickly than you can come back from debasement. So this notion that governments don't default because they can print more currency works in theory, but in practice, governments choose to default, which means that if I give you the US Treasury bond rate, the likelihood that you're going to have default is very, very low. But if I gave you the Zimbabwean currency, even though they could print more quachas to pay off their debt, if that hole is deep enough, they will choose to default rather than print the currency. Which then brings me to the question of what do we do then? So I'll take you through a couple of choices you have. If you're anybody doing Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe is not Kwacha, that's Zambia is Kwacha. I don't even know what is a Zimbabwean currency, whatever it is now. But if you, let, let's say you're doing a Nigerian company and you are trying to come up with a risk free rate. This is the first step in the process, right? You're stuck. You want a risk-free rate in IRA. I'll take you to the first way in which you can get a risk-free rate. You can start with a government bond rate and clean it up. Let me explain. In November of 2013, one of the companies I was analyzing was Tata Motors and I wanted to do it in rupees. I wanted a rupee risk-free rate. So I found a 10-year rupee bond denominated in rupee, in, um, in, it was an Indian government bond, 10-year, rupee denominated bond, 8.82%. And I was so happy, I said, I cut the risk free rate. But before I use it as a risk free rate, I have to check to see whether there's any default risk in the Indian government when it borrows in rupees, right? Now, I'm not going to spend my time doing that or asking people what I cheated. So here's what I did I went to the Moody's website and I could have gone to the SP website or the Fitch website or any of the big ratings agencies. And if you go to the website, you have this section called sovereign ratings. I clicked on sovereign ratings and it gives you a list of 140 countries that Moody's has ratings for. And it gives you two ratings for every country, a foreign currency rating and a local currency rating. So when I look at India, I see a foreign currency rating and a local currency rating. You say, why two ratings? You know what Moody's is giving you with the foreign currency rating? When India borrows money, dollars or euros or foreign currency, it says, this is our rating for India, BAA2. The local currency rating, at least in theory, tells you how much risk Moody sees in India defaulting when they issue bonds in rupees. And I was praying, hoping that I'd see a AAA rating because if I'd seen a AAA rating there, you know what I'd have done, right? I'd have used the 8.82% as my risk free rate in rupees and blame Moody's if something went wrong. But they didn't even give me that out. In November of 2013, the sovereign rating for India was BAA3. For those of you who have some sense of ratings, AAA in sovereign ratings basically means we are viewed as default free or close to default free. The US in Moody's is a AAA rating. S&P actually has a rating below AAA for the US, but the US Moody's is a AAA rating, Switzerland, Australia, Germany, France, all have AAA ratings. India had a BAA3 rating. So what is it telling me? The 8.2% that I see as the government bond rate is not quite risk-free because some of it is for default risk. If I can somehow figure out how much of that 8.82% is because of default risk, I can clean up for it, right? And I'm gonna take you through a more detailed process later of how I come up with the defaults. But if you give me a rating for a country, I can guess what kind of default spread you would have in a bond. A BAA3 rated sovereign bond in November of 2013 had a default spread of 2.25%. Hey, pause right there. 
I have an Indian government bond rate. Rupee bond is 8.82%. I'm worried about default risk. And based on the rating, the default spread should be 2.25%. It's like a little math problem, right? If I can somehow take that out of the government bond rate, I would have a risk-free rate in Indian rupees. So I took the 8.82%, subtracted out the 2.25%. And you see why I subtract out? Because I don't want it in there. I want something risk-free. My risk-free rate in Indian rupees was 6.57%. Just to give you another example, in China, I was, uh, you know, because of Baidu, I was doing it in local currency again to get a renminbi or a yuan risk-free rate. I started with the 10-year government bond rate, which is 4.3%. This is a local currency bond. China's rating is much, was much better than India's. It was rated double eight three. And the spread for it is 0.8%. You take the 0.8% out from the 4.3%, you get a risk-free rate of 3.5%. So if you are working with a currency where there is no default free entity, so don't do this with the dollar, don't do this with the euro, don't do this with franc, but you're doing rupees, reais, Indonesian rupiah, you have cleaning up to do. You've got to take the government bond rate, net out the default spread to come up with the risk rate. But there will be currencies where even this is not doable. I don't think any of you is doing an Egyptian company, but if you're doing an Egyptian company in Egyptian pounds, you're not going to find a 10 year government bond denominated in pounds. So in, in, the Egyptian government does not issue bonds. You see, what do I do then if I can't even get a risk rate? rate? You can analyze any company in any currency. You could take an Egyptian company and analyze it in US dollars if you want to. If you do it right, it, everything's going to work out, but you can pick a different currency if you're truly desperate. If you're working with a country where you can't even get the risk free rate, don't spend weeks on it, just move on. And that's why I said in Brazil, in the late 90s, people moved on. They didn't even try doing things in Rias. You couldn't even get a risk-free rate in reais. They did everything in US dollars. It's a different frame of reference, but if you do it right, it'll work out. And the other thing Brazilians did is currencies bring an in inflation into your analysis. They took inflation entirely out. It's called a real analysis. You do real cash flows and real discount rates. They said, we give up, we throw up our hands. And so if you cannot find a local currency risk-free rate, you can move on, try to do things in a different currency or perhaps do everything, everything in real terms. Any questions? So if you have a currency where there's a default free entity issuing the currency, the US dollar, the euro, just use that as your risk free rate. If you have a currency where the entity issuing that currency, the government has default risk, clean up for it. Um, Professor, can you explain yes. again, why do you use the risk free rate of the currency um, that your company is in, given that you know anybody can go and invest in whatever currency they would like. And if I, let me take that to the next question, would you rather invest in currency with higher rates than or lower rates? I want to well, put you on this one. If I was in a country with higher rate with higher rates, I would rather go invest in like the US dollar or someone with a lower that, rate. So why are you investing in the lower rate? Higher rates are better than lower rates, right? So why is it that a lower, implicit in your question actually is the answer to your question. That's why I'm putting you on the spot. So why were you willing to accept the lower rate on the US dollar over the higher rate in the Turkish lira? Because the risk is lower. No, but let's say you cleaned up for the risk. Um, then I'm not sure. Does anybody want to try? Because this is, in fact, the next question. Why do risk-free rates vary across currencies? Even if you cleaned up a default risk, I promise you, there'll be some currencies where you learn higher rates than other currencies, but it's not a freebie. What is the magic ingredient that explains differences in rates and removes these easy ways to make money? Interest rate parity. And interest rate parity comes from an even deeper relationship, which is you know, what are the Big Mac index, that inflation is different in different currencies. Basically, what's going to happen is a higher inflation currency will devalue. So when you look at investing at the higher rate that you get in the Turkish lira and the lower rate in the US dollar, 
there's no free lunch here. Neither is better because if you invest in the lower rate US dollar, you will earn a lower rate of return you know, uh, in, in percentage terms, if you just look at the percent, but if you invest at a higher rate lira, the devaluation you're going to get in the currency will take away the difference. There is no better currency to invest in than and worse currency to invest in because ultimately inflation differences explain differences in rates across currencies. It's, I think, a fundamental thing that I'm going to keep coming back to in this class because it's a mistake a lot of CFOs make. Remember that we talked about, you know, uh, about borrowing the, the original example of steady safe, right? They didn't know the, what did the investment bank tell steady safe to do? Go borrow in rupiah. I'm sorry, go borrow in dollars. It's cheaper. You can see the mistake there. It looks cheaper because the rates are lower, but there's an inflation component that's going to take care of the difference. Uh, professor? Uh, yes. The country's economy. Uh, what do you think about the country's economy? Because uh, I can say about Russia, uh, because in 2014, $1 became twice more expensive than it was in two, 2013. And does uh, any country's economy affect this rate? Or well, it can at the margin. Real interest rates can be affected, but the more global a currency becomes, the less that effect becomes because you're no longer tied. Because let's face it, everything is tied together in many countries, right? The economy does well, inflation is lower, everybody's doing better, rates reflect that. So it's very difficult to separate the inflation effect from the real growth effect. So for instance, Brazil had hyperinflation, the economy collapsed. So you had this mix of factors, economy is collapsing, inflation is high. But if you look across time over long periods, and that's the key, and you look at why do some currencies appreciate and other currencies depreciate, it's no contest. It's inflation differences over long periods that is the dominant variable. In any given year, all kinds of things can happen. And in fact, in November of 2013, if you look at differences across currencies, and remember, I'm cleaning up for default risk, so it's no longer higher risk in one currency than the other. Even if I clean up for it, risk-free rates are higher in some currencies than in others. So when you pick a, a, a currency of your company, keep that in mind. There is no right currency to work with. There has to be a consistent currency. And here's why. If you decide to analyze a Turkish company in Turkish lira, your risk-free rate is going to be higher. Your hurdle rates are going to be higher. You're saying, this is terrible. But when you compute returns on projects, you have to do them in Turkish lira as well, which means that same inflation that hurt you on the discount rate will help you on the returns. The key is to be consistent, not right. Pick a currency and be consistent with that. And when people get into trouble in corporate finance and valuation, it's because they're mixing and matching currencies. But their discount rates in one currency, but the cash flows and returns are in a different currency. That you already broke in a first principle. Everything's going to fall apart if you do that. So in January 2021, if you look at risk-free rates across currencies, and I've listed about 40 currencies where I was able to find a government bond. Here's what you get. The risk-free rate in Zambia and Kwacha is much higher than the risk-free rate in Nigeria and Naira, which is much higher than the risk-free rate in US dollars which is not only much higher than the risk-free rate in euros, but notice what's happened to the risk-free rate in euros and Swiss francs. You look at the very end, they're actually negative. And that freaks people out that risk-free rates can actually be negative, but that I think is the world we live in now. High inflation currencies will have high risk-free rates, low inflation currencies will have low risk-free rates. And if you have a deflationary currency, you could potentially have negative risk-free rates. It's not a good thing or a bad thing. It is what it is. And if you pick the deflationary currency for your analysis, you're going to get a really low hurdle rate, but don't celebrate too quickly. The same forces that made your hurdle rate low will also keep your returns and your cash flows low because you picked a currency where deflation is the rule and that's going to drive your growth rates and your cash flows in the future. Any questions about risk-free rates? Um, professor, just a quick question. If a, a company has cash flows in multiple currencies, um, it's just a company which has making money from all over the world, would we use the yeah. free rate of um, where it's getting its primary cash flows from? 
I'll, I would pick whatever your financials are primarily reporting. I'll give you an example. If you do Coca-Cola, the easiest currency to work with is the US dollar because all of your financials are in US dollars. It doesn't mean you can't do it in euros, but it's a lot more work. If you do an oil company pretty much anywhere in the world, including Petrobras, you know the currency you're going to do your valuation in? Commodity companies historically have reported their financials in US dollars, no matter where they are in the world. So with the Petrobras, it's easier to work in US dollars because everything's already given in dollars. If you're in Nestle, you could probably work in three or four different currencies because they actually report annual, their annual report, they report things in Swiss francs, but they also report them in British pounds and US dollars. So I would take a pragmatic approach, look at the financials, see what currency the financials and that should be a starting point. So the financials are in a particular currency, start with that. But if you run into too many tangles getting a risk-free rate in that currency, just move on because the conversions are not a big deal. So start with the currency of the financials and every multinational has a currency which is their reporting currency. Start with that. And if that doesn't work, then you can switch currencies. So let's talk about the equity risk premium. Equity, I'll tell you what the equity risk premium Please is trying to measure. Then let's talk about how we go about doing it. The equity risk premium is the premium you demand as an investor for investing in equities as a class. Over and above what you can make risk-free. So what do we say the USD bond rate was 1.3%? You know what, what I'm asking you with the equity risk premium is how much more than 1.3% would I need to offer you for you to invest your money in stocks? So let's take a pause right there. The answer to that question is going to be greater than zero. Do you see why? Because you know, if you're taking that risk, you want to get a reward. It's going to be higher for some of you and lower for the others. You know why? Because it depends on your risk aversion. The more risk averse you are as a person, the higher your risk premium. So let's take a pause there. Why would risk aversion vary across people? Let's look at some generic evidence. When you look at Younger people versus older people. You know what studies seem to show about risk aversion? Are older people more risk averse or less risk averse than younger people? More. They they tend to be more risk averse. And I'll take this to its logical conclusion. If your risk aversion increases as you get older and you demand a larger risk premium, think about markets like Japan. What do we know about Japan? It's an aging population, right? If I hold everything else constant, you know what that's going to mean, right? The risk premium that people are going to demand in Japanese equities is going to be greater than the risk premium in Indian equities, holding all else constant. Age matters. Now, here's a trickier one, and this might get me into trouble. Male versus female. What do you think the studies show about who's more risk averse, men or women? Women. Actually, the studies are interesting. Young women are more risk averse than young men. And I can attest to this fact. I have four kids, and as they were growing up and learning how to drive, the only one whose car I would get into while they were learning how to drive was my daughter's car. No way was I getting into a 20-year-old male's car and let him drive. because So young women are more risk averse than young men. But as you age, the risk aversion coincides, except for one small thing. Young men are more willing to continue to take these small, often stupid, I mean, older men, I was still, you know, the gambling risk you take where you tend to with a friend, I'll pay $50 if, you know, the Pittsburgh Steelers win this weekend. Women have to kind of ruminate over those still when they, so it turns out as you get older, risk aversion starts to even out, except for these small gambling risk aversions. But there's a part of risk aversion that has nothing to do with age or sex. You were born with it. I can tell you which one of my four kids will be invested in bonds for the rest of their lives. My oldest still holds the banister. He's 30 years old. He still holds the banister while he's coming down the stairs, afraid he's going to fall. He's a bond investor. If you ever saw him, I fall now. I might fall now. Let me hold on. My youngest, when he was two, took off from the top stair, expecting to be caught before he hit the bottom stair. It's an option trader right there. He's probably trading GameStop while, while I'm talking. 
So risk aversion is something that you're born with. It's affected by your circumstances. It's also affected by experiences. People magically get more risk averse after a crisis, after, so it's, it's, so we're gonna start with an experiment. And this experiment, what I'd like you to think about, there's no right answer, so don't, don't overthink it, is I'm going to ask you for your risk premium. You ready? I was going to do it as a, as, as a Zoom poll, but we might as well do it as a non-Zoom poll. So let's assume that each of you has some wealth. We have to start with that presumption, right? Even if you don't act like you do, you got your entire wealth invested in something risk-free and right now it's making 3% guaranteed. Ready so far? All of your money is invested in something 3% guaranteed. I come to you, I'm, I'm a mutual, I've quit my job. I've become a salesperson for the Vanguard 500 index fund, the largest index fund in the world. So I've made it very specific. These are the S&P 500 companies. So I come to you with an offer. I say, would you be willing to invest in this index fund? So here's what I want you to think about. Right now you're making 3% guarantee. How much of a return would I need to offer you as an expected return on the index fund for you to switch from where you are now to that index fund? Everybody clear on the question? So you're making 3% guaranteed, I'm offering an index fund. And I'm gonna go through a series of answers. I was gonna say none of them are wrong, but one actually, I hope none of you picks. Let's see if you get that one nailed down. But the rest, it's your choice. How many would accept less than 3%? as you expected return. Thank God for small blessings. If most of you had said yes, I'd have said the rest of the class is kind of moot, let's just quit while we're ahead. You see why less than 3% would make no sense. If you're making 3% guaranteed, accepting an expected return of less than 3% on stocks would be crazy. Let's keep going. How many of you would accept between three and 5% as you expect return? That would be a risk premium of between zero and 2%. Anybody in this room? Would accept three to five. Somebody had their hand up. Okay, uh, Gil. Gil, so you'd accept what? How much? Four or five? Somewhere around there. Okay. Is Gil the most risk averse person in this room, or the least risk averse person in the room? The least. <laughs> He's the least risk of us. There's nothing wrong with it, right? Because you can tell as he ages, then he'll have far more money in stocks than most of you, far more risky investments because he's less risk of us. But two people, I think, or three people put up their hand between five and seven. Okay. More hands are going up. Between seven and nine. Nine and 11. You're getting the other end of the distribution, Dan's right there. A higher this number becomes, the more risk averse you are as an individual. If this were the entire market, I'm home free. Because here's what, how I'd get my equity risk premium. I, because each of you has given me your equity risk premium, right? Because if you said seven, your equity risk premium is seven minus three, which is four. If you say it's nine, it's six. If this were the entire market, here's what I would do. I would take a weighted average of the numbers each of you gave me. Say weighted by what? Not by how much enthusiasm you showed when you put up your hand, but weighted by how much money you have. Let me be brutally honest with you. If you have no money, I don't care what your risk premium is. You can whisper it to me, you can yell it at me, it doesn't matter. If you have a billion dollars, I'm really interested in what your equity risk premium is. Now do you see why people care so much what Warren Buffett thinks about the market? You bring $40 billion into the game. You have a much bigger weight in this game. In a perfect world, that's how we get equity risk premiums. We'd ask every person, what's your risk premium? We take a weighted average based on their wealth. And already you can see why this is almost a non-starter, right? Because think about this. You have 55, 60 million people invest in the market. What are you going to do? Send them a mass email saying, tell me your equity risk premium and how much money you have. Good luck with that, on that response. You'd be put in with a Nigerian email you know, folder and said, Never worry, I'm not answering that. So the question we're going to face is, given that we kind of ask people what the equity risk premium is, how do we estimate an equity risk premium? And next session we start off, I'm going to give you three different ways. 
you can get it. One is you can do a survey of a subset of investors, portfolio managers, people with a lot of money, maybe you can get a sense of the risk premium. The second is you look backwards, you look at the history and say, what did we make on stocks versus T-bonds or T-bills? It's called a historical premium. Still the default approach that many analysts use, what do we have made in the past? And I'll talk about why I don't like it. And I'm gonna offer you a third approach where you look forward and you think about equity risk premiums based on what people pay for risky assets. At the end of that, we still have to make a decision. Which of these numbers are we going to latch on to? Because that's going to be that second input we need for risk and return models and finance. So I'm going to let you guys go. Any last questions before I sign off? Okay. I will see you on Wednesday. Thank you, Professor. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.